that's really nice to have this kind of conversation. So, uh, as I said, my name is uh, Sebastian, and I will talk about uh, symmetries in machine learning. And symmetries in machine learning is a really large, uh, you know, very vast subject. So we're not going to cover everything in, in one hour. And there's obviously going to be a bias from my own experience. So I thought that I would tell you a little bit about my background so that you understand where or why I chose some of the things I'm going to talk about. So my background is I studied mathematics and I've been working in machine learning for a few years uh, now. But during these few years, I worked a lot with physicists on physics problem where symmetries are very important, even without machine learning, symmetries are very important. So despite working on physics project, I'm actually not a physicist. So I'm lucky enough to work with people who understand physics, but we talk about things, if you have questions about physics, I might give the wrong answer, very likely. Uh, but everything else, I hopefully I can uh, help with. So the two projects I uh, worked on, are, um, to the, the two main projects I, I worked on in physics are here, called free energy computation on the left and particle physics on uh, the right. And I, will, I won't introduce them properly now because I will come back to them at the end of the talk. But these are the, some of the motivation for the kind of thing I've been interested in in uh, machine learning. So on the left, it's about modeling uh, atoms in space and how they, the con different possible configuration of atoms, phase transition, you know, going from a gas to a liquid to a solid and these sort of things. And on the right, it's about quantum field theory. So it's about understanding what happened inside a, a proton, for example. You know, you have quarks and you have forces. And so about, it's about this, this, this sort of things. And I will come back later to explain why symmetries were useful in this kind of uh, project. So the plan for the talk is as follows. Uh, so first of all, I will introduce the language that will be recurrent into this uh, talk about what are uh, symmetries, what do I mean exactly by uh, symmetry. So that's going to be more of a mathematical nature. Then I will talk about why you symmetry, why I think that symmetries are useful in uh, machine learning. Why do they help? Thirdly, I will talk about how to use symmetries. There's a lot of different techniques that exist out there on how to incorporate symmetries, how to use them in a machine learning model. And then finally, I will conclude by going back to these two projects that I mentioned earlier and try to explain, to reuse some of the things I talked about earlier and see how they impact, how they impacted these two projects and continue to impact. These projects are still uh, ongoing. Okay, so let's start with uh, this uh, section on what are symmetries. So here is a mural of uh, Islamic art that you will, you will find in the Alhambra in, uh, in Spain. And uh, it's actually said that this painting uh, inspired Escher. So I don't know if you know about Escher, this painter who uh, used a lot of symmetries in his uh, painting. Apparently he was greatly inspired by this kind of uh, painting. And we say that there are symmetries here because we can move this drawing around and it looks like Overall, the structure is not going to change. So if we start by abstracting a little bit away, and let's start by ignoring the color. If we ignore the color and just look at the geometric pattern, you see that there's an underlying pattern or tiling here in the painting. Uh, and this tiling is a grid. And we will think of this grid as extending to all directions to infinity in all directions. And you see that if you move this grid in different ways, in a proper way, then the new grid will overlap with the old grid. So in that sense, we do have uh, symmetries. So here are three examples of symmetries that we can find. Uh, on the left over there, we have a rotation by an angle of 60 degrees. We have a small translation, and then we have a reflection along the line. Okay, And it turns out that all of the symmetries of this pattern can be generated just by composing these three symmetries in a different way. Now, a rotation by six degrees does indeed leave the whole uh, tiling uh, globally invariant, as shown in the anim animation on, on the left. And on the right, we see an animation of a horizontal uh, translation uh, that also leaves a tiling invariant, but it only leaves from the beginning to the end. And there's a lot of intermediary symmetries, uh, transformation, which are not symmetries of the tiling. There would be symmetries of uh, something different. Okay. So for example, rotation by just an angle of five degrees will not leave uh, the tiling uh, invariant. 
So we have, in this case, we say we have a discrete group of symmetries. And this notion of having these are a discrete group or continuous group of symmetries will be used against later. If you can rotate by arbitrary small values, then that would be a continuous group of transformation. But here we have to rotate by multiple of 60 degrees. And that means that we have this discrete group of rotations. So what are symmetries? I guess and we've been using this word symmetries without fully defining it here. Well, a nice way to look at a, what an object is, is to look at what you can do with it. What are the properties? How, they, how can you transform that object rather than the, the constituent of the object? So symmetries are things that can be composed. Okay, if you take two symmetries and you compose them, you have again a, a, a symmetries. So we had generators previously. We had this rotation, this translation, and this reflection. And we could compose them to create more complicated symmetries. Symmetries can be inverted, so there's no loss of information in a sense. If you apply something in symmetry, you should be able to have still enough information to come back to where uh, you started. So for the translation, you just have to go in the opposite direction. And for the rotation, you just have to take minus the uh, angle. And a very important of, uh, property of the symmetries is that they preserve something. And in this case, what they preserve is the overall uh, pattern in these pictures. If you translate, you end up with the same pattern in the picture. So using a more formal mathematical language, uh, the composition of symmetries will be noted like a multiplication. So think of matrix multiplication, for example. It's probably the best way to, to think about it. And we will use the letter G here to denote small g, to denote uh, element of our group. If we consider a bunch of elements, G1, G2, G3, we can compose them in different ways. You know, we can first compose G1 with G2, and then compose the result with G3. Or we can first compose G2 and G3 and then compose the result with G1. So, and the way where we put the parentheses shouldn't matter, and that's called associative key. The order should matter, and in general it will matter, but the where you put the parentheses shouldn't matter, and that's called associativity. <laughs> the second property, this G E equal E G equal G, says that there should be an identity. There should be a way of changing nothing. Okay? That's just the identity, the trivial symmetry. And the third property is that uh, repeat the fact that symmetries are invertible. So for every G, there should be a G inverse. And when you compose that, you just get the identity. So let's continue in this uh, direction of abstracting away what a group of symmetries uh, is. So a group of symmetry is something that transforms something else. So in particular, we need a space of transformation and a space of objects. Having these two things is very important for us. So the object are the things being transformed, and the symmetries are the, for, are the, are the transformations themselves which transform the object. For example, the group of rotation in R3, so the space in which uh, we live, will transform points or objects. And if you have a cube or cloud of points in R3, you can rotate uh, them. So another example would be the way you manipulate a Rubik's Cube. So if you've played with a Rubik's Cube, you see that uh, so there's certain motion. So the, the, the way you can transform the, the, the Rubik's Cube can be very complicated, but every time there's just like a simple transformation. That takes us back to this idea of generators. Remember, so for this picture on the Alhambra, we had just three generators for the whole group. Well, for the Rubik's Cube, turning the faces, you have just few ways of turning faces, but that can generate a very large group of transformations. So this turning of the faces are the generators of uh, the, the, the group. The, if you've ever looked at algorithms that explain how to solve the Rubik's Cubes, they're always given in terms of these generators. So you look at the current state of your Rubik's Cube, so you look at where the colors are, and you choose which generator to apply. And that's already starting to look a little bit like you know, the kind of thing we see in machine learning where you have a map from uh, state to actions. And that's exactly how the Rubik's Cube, the Rubik's Cube has been solved by, uh, by machine learning. It's exactly how this kind of thing has uh, uh, worked. So <coughs> despite having very few generators, you still end up with a very large group when composing them. And note that the dissymmetries transform the colors on the faces but they preserve the general structure of the cube. When 
once you transform a face, you still end up with a cube, which has three by three, which is nine squares on every face. So the symmetries transform an object. And in mathematics, we call that an action. More formally, a group G, so G is going to be our group of transformation over there, acts on a space X if for every small G in G, so every symmetry, there is a transformation from X to X. So think of X as being our Rubik's cube and G being uh, the space of all symmetries that we can uh, apply. So let's end this section uh, with a set of properties that we will revisit during the talk. So certain groups are discrete and others are continuous. And depending on which is which, there will be a different ways to incorporate the symmetries in your machine learning architecture. On the right, the first uh, example is that of transformation in Rn, so uh, n-dimensional space. We already spoke about translations in vector spaces, and these are continuous transformation, as you can smoothly vary from one translation to uh, one uh, translation to, to another. On the left, we have the discrete counterpart. So now, if you just look at points with integer coordinate, you will still have translations, a group of symmetry which are translation, but this time you can only translate by integer amount. So you have now a, a discrete group of symmetries on the left. So other type of symmetries uh, that we have already encountered in the previous talk are permutations acting on a set. Um, and this is related to, yeah, to transformer, and this is related to uh, GNN as well, that we, which we already heard about. For continuous transformations, I already mentioned translations and rotations. We also have, for example, more fancy groups like SLN, which is a group of matrices with determinant one, and turns out that this is exactly the group that of, transform, of linear transformation that preserve volume. When you apply a matrix in SLN to an object, it might be deformed, you know, it might be stretched in one direction and squashed in another direction, but it preserves volume. Okay. Um, so with this example, we're looking, we're still looking at transforming things inside the vector space, but we could also look at transformations inside more fancy objects such as uh, spheres or more, com more complicated geometries and a, a vector space. And we will do that a little bit later as well. The trivial action is basically you have a group of symmetry, but they all happen to do absolutely nothing. And that sounds like a particularly boring example, but it's a way of unifying certain object machine learning, and we will use this trivial action later uh, during the, the, the talk. So finally, let's consider the group of invertible matrices. All of the invertible matrices, and ask ourselves, is that a continuous or a discrete group? Well, clearly, you can make small modification to the entries in your matrix, so that looks like it's continuous. But you also know that invertible matrices has either positive, strictly positive, or strictly negative determinant, which means that you cannot continuously go from a matrix of positive determinant to a matrix of negative determinant without crossing a non-invertible matrix. So these groups, in general, it's true that groups will have both some continuous and some discrete uh, properties. Okay, so that concludes the first uh, introduction that was fairly mathematical and fairly abstract in, in, in nature. Now let's look at some motivation for why we might want to uh, use symmetry before seeing concrete examples of, of how to use symmetries. So there are many reasons, uh, and I certainly haven't got them uh, all, but here are a few which I think are worth mentioning and few which I, I, I've been involved with. So one of them is about disentanglement. It's this property that disentanglement is about finding, you know, some certain objects have a shape and a color. And we know that, but how do you let a machine discover this sort of thing by itself? Because you can, you know that you can take an object and change the color without changing the shape or change the shape without changing the color. But how do you let a machine discover that by itself? And that's about, that's a whole film of, uh, the a whole field of disentanglement. Another reason will be uh, data efficiency, and I'll explain why I think that data efficiency is important. Uh, uh, I mean, why symmetries are important for data efficiency. And then also the, the third one is just an observation that a lot of the successful uh, tools in, uh, in neural network uh, 
seem to be respecting some, so, some form of symmetries. So that's just like an observation. <laughs> so let's start with uh, disentanglement. And so if you're, I, I, I'm going to argue that if you're interested in disentanglement and what this paper is arguing uh, uh, about, is that then you should be interested in symmetries. So this paper uses symmetries to propose a general definition of what is disentanglement, okay? The crux of the idea of this paper is that uh, it's represented in these two pictures at the, uh, at the bottom. So this first example is this example which I already mentioned where objects can have shape and can have colors and it's possible to shape, or actually here I'm more interested, shape, position, and colors. And you see that you can transform the first object, the, at the top row, mm -hmm. you have the moon, which changes color and position while the star is being left invariant. And if you want to move the moon, then you have to move all of the points in the moon. It's not possible. If you were starting to move just some point on the moon and then you know, to the left and then leave the other one, then you would, say, you would say, actually, that was not an object. That was two objects because I was able to separate them. So the fact that modification of some points of the moon will imply modification of all of the other points, suggests that all these points are strongly related to each other and that you have an object, okay? And this, this idea was made more uh, concrete in the paper or, or, or over there using ID from representation theory. The second thing that this paper argued about is that in older papers, you will often see people trying to uh, discover you know, factors of variation, such as shape or object, and project them to a one-dimensional space. Like, for example, the color on the left. That makes sense. If you're trying to, to say what is the color of this object, it makes sense to try to project it to one-dimensional space. But if it turns out that one of your factors of variation, for example, is direction, so direction can be represented by a point on the sphere. Well, there's no way to split your sphere into a product of two different things, okay? So if you really are interested in disentangling properties, what this paper is arguing is that uh, you should take the geometry and the symmetry seriously, and you end up with a definition where some properties are multidimensional. So sphere is going to be two-dimensional object, for example. So another reason, very uh, down-to-earth reason, to consider symmetry is data efficiency. And it turns out that there's been multiple papers. Here is one of them, one of the uh, oldest one, I, I, I guess, from 2014, uh, which already back then argued that capturing the symmetries in the data reduce sample complexity. So what we mean by sample complexity is that you need less training, okay? You alt and it makes sense, you automatically generalize. If you, if you model knows about symmetries, if you learn about, you know, a bottle in this position here, and then I transport the, the bottle to this position here. If you know about symmetries, then you automatically learn something about here. So you know, if you know how to grab the bottle here, you know how to grab it here because of these symmetries. And that lets you learn much more efficiently. So let's not look at about uh, more concretely some of these benefits considering symmetries in deep learning in more detail. So the quote of the previous slide talked about data efficiency as a benefit of symmetries. So let's consider both discrete and continuous actions and see how they differ, how they have different effects on data efficiency. So what I will argue here is that in the case of discrete symmetries, the effect is that of reducing the volume of the space which you are working with, okay? So let's look at these pictures. And uh, the cube on the left assumes that we have one symmetry. We happen to have one symmetry in this cube where we know that point on the left should behave exactly as point on the right, according to this uh, symmetry. If you do that, we have cut the cube into two equal parts, and it's okay to learn on only half of the volume of the cube. Now, if you have even more symmetries, every time you add new symmetries, you keep on cutting your cube into smaller and smaller, smaller volume, and you see that you can train on even smaller and smaller part of the cube, and know immediately something about the entire cube. Okay, so in that sense, we have reduced the volume of the number of points on which we need uh, to train. And in this example, it's reduced by a factor of four, but sometimes can be reduced by much larger factors. Of course, instead of explicitly respecting the symmetries, uh, a very common approach and very valid approach is to use data augmentation. 
So data augmentation is this idea that, well, I might happen to have only points in the top right corner here on the cube, but I know about certain symmetries. So what data augmentation is going to, to do is say, well, I'm going to apply the symmetries to my uh, red points here and create a much larger data set. So what would be common, for example, if you, uh, let's say that you're trying to do a classifier about cats and dogs, and you know that if you take the image of a, of a cat or a dog and you rotate it by 90 degrees, it should, should still be a cat or a dog. So if you have a, a data set of images of cats and dogs, you can automatically make it much bigger just by applying this kind of tricks of rotation and this kind of symmetry. So you end up with a much larger data set on which, your data, on which you can uh, train. Okay, so this kind of data augmentation is exactly what is done in many modern self-supervised contrastive learning approaches like simply relic or bio if you've read this paper but so basically you find it a lot in the, in, in in the literature so this cube you only have four symmetries it's not uh that much so if you don't have many symmetries in your problem this is a very efficient way uh to let your model learn the symmetries by itself and you are free to use whatever architecture you want. So you can just use whatever architecture that exists off the, off the shelf, use it, just do data augmentation, and then your model will just figure it out. With larger group of symmetries, uh, this might not be such a good option. So for example, if you have n points in space, where n is even relatively large, let's say you know, 50 points in, in, in space, and your problem is invariant under permutation of these points, for example, let's say that you're looking at particles in, uh, in, in space, and it doesn't really matter in which order you choose this particle. Okay, when you code this thing into uh, your favorite uh, machine learning framework, it does matter in which, or, or in which order you enter this point into your, your array, but you know that it shouldn't matter for the machine learning uh, problem. So if you have n point in space, the number of symmetries for reordering is factorial n. So even for something as small as 50, this is a huge number. Okay, and trying to do data augmentation on something like that is not going to work. It's not going to scale very well. It's unlikely to, to work. So it's much better to try to bake in the symmetries inside the machine learning architectures. Now, if your group is not discrete, but uh, continuous, so uh, let's consider the case. We're going to look at a very toy example uh, here. Uh, because it's much simpler to, to, to think about. So in that case, it turns out that the effect of respecting symmetries is not of reducing the volume, but one of reducing the numbers of degree of freedom. So if you have a problem of a certain dimension, it turns out that by respecting continuous symmetries, you reduce the dimensionality of your problem. Okay. So we look at two examples. The first one is the one where rotations act on the sphere. So your problems is considering points on a sphere. So this is the type of data. And we assume that we have a symmetry for every single rotation on the sphere. OK? Well, if you do that, well, you, it's easy to see that any two points is equivalent. If it turns out, then you should be able to learn, at a, if you respect the symmetry, you should be able to learn at a single point, let's say the North Pole on this uh, sphere, and then know something about everything on the entire sphere. So the dimensionality of the problem should really be zero, the single point. So let's see how we can maybe recover that by looking at uh, the action and our, and our spaces so that maybe we can come up with a general formula that will work even in this non-trivial example. So the dimension of the sphere is two. The dimension of the space of uh, rotation is three. That's because whenever you, de to define a rotation, you just have to define three angles around three different uh, axes, okay? If you just naively try to do, you know, dimension of space two minus three, you'd end up with minus one, which clearly is nonsensical. There's no space of dimension minus one. So there's something missing. And it turns out that what is missing is, if you fix a point, let's say the North Pole, well, there are some symmetries that will leave this point invariant. And in particular, the symmetries around uh, the, you know, the, the z-axis are going to leave this thing invariant. And this is called a stabilizer and has a dimension of one. So the correct formula to define the dimension of your problem once you take symmetry into account is two minus three plus one, which is equal to zero. 
Now we can try this, this formula into a slightly, still very, very toyish example, but still a slightly more complicated example where this time we are not going to just have points on the sphere, but we're going to consider points and tangent vectors. Now, what is the dimension of the space? Well, we still have a dimension of two for the sphere, but if we just consider tangent vector at every single point, you see that when you fix a point, you cannot leave the sphere. So the tangent vectors are from a plane, which have dimension two. So the total dimension of the space is four this time. Our group SO3 still acts on this entire thing, but this time, if you take a generic vector tangent to the North Pole, this generic vector is not going to be invariant anymore by this rotation around the z-axis. So now the stabilizer are actually trivial eh, and have dimension uh, zero. Okay. Tangents of our tangent space is four. I said two dimensions for the sphere plus two dimensions for the tangent plane at every single point on the sphere. The dimension of SO3, we've already said, is three. And the dimension of the stabilizer is, not, is now zero. So the dimension of our radius space is four minus three plus zero, which is equal to one. So again, this is a very trivial example, but if you have a very large group of symmetries, and we will see uh, one uh, such large group later, then this can make a massive difference to the, date, to the efficiency of your machine learning architecture. Um, so, um, finally, uh, those are, yes, yeah, sorry. Hmm? Oh, the stabilizer. Um, so the stabilizer is a, set, is a subset of symmetries that will leave a particular point invariant. So in, if you go back to this thing uh, sorry, here, if we just have the, the, uh, the, the, the sphere and not the tangent spaces, the stabilizer of the North Pole are going to be the rotation around the sled axis. Because when you apply that, that's going to change other points of the sphere, but it leaves the North Pole invariant. So the stabilizer is attached to a particular point. Yeah. And in, the, in this uh, case, well, there's no more uh, stabilizers. Okay. Any other question? So um, finally, uh, I think I would say that, yeah. The plane. So the stabilizer is a group of symmetries. So the plane is part of the data. Think of it as your data space and your symmetries. The plane is part of the data space. These are your points. You know, these are your images of cats and dogs or something like that. And the symmetries are how you transform these this, this images of cats and dogs. Yeah? So the, that, that's why we... Does that... that, that, that? Yeah. So uh, finally, I think that's a very uh, practical reason for why to use uh, symmetries is that if you look at some of the most successful uh, deep learning architectures, they all respect some type, of, some type of symmetries. In the next section, we'll see. So here we have conversion neural network, recurrent neural network, and graph neural network. And we'll see in the next sections what, what are the symmetries which are respected in uh, this uh, architecture. So, Let's do that uh, now, how to use symmetries. So the first one is CNN, and the symmetries here are discrete, not continuous, but discrete translations. Uh, at the heart of CNN, there's this idea that if you have a robot which is in one part of an image, or if it's in another part of the image, you should really treat it the same way. So if you learn how to recognize robot in the top left of the picture, you should also be able to recognize robots in the bottom right of uh, the, the, the picture. And CNN help you do that by doing this kind of, we've already seen this uh, uh, animation in the, in the previous uh, talk. And they really let you do that by doing the same computation at every single point of the image. So they have this translation symmetry built into uh, them. Recurrent neural networks are about time translation, so it's not about spatial translation, but now it's about time translation, and this idea that if you learn how to deal with a robot at time zero, you know, in the morning, you should know how to deal with the robot in the evening. There might not be any difference. If everything is equal, light and everything is equal, you should be able to not care about the time of the day. 
And that's really what uh, RNN are able, uh, able to do, LSTMs or GRU or whatever. All of these RNN, they, they, they do this sort of thing. And, they usually, and if you want to break time translation, actually, you, work, you have to work hard to, uh, to, to do that. And GNN, or transformers, we saw that uh, GNN uh, transformer, a particular uh, uh, case of uh, GNN, these are all about permutation symmetries. GNN might be about local permutation, but these are all about permutation uh, symmetries. This idea is that if you have these robots and then you permute them, uh, you should still be able to say something about them as long as you know the, about the relation between these different uh, objects. Okay, so we've seen some concrete examples. We went pretty fast over there, but we, we, we've seen some concrete examples. I, I want to step back and start looking at what it means for a neural network to respect symmetries. I've, I've used this word about respecting symmetries a lot. I haven't actually explained much what I mean by uh, that. So I really want to uh, look at precise example of what it means. So here's a classifier, okay, uh, you know, classic example, where let's say that we're trying to recognize cats and dogs. Uh, that's a dog. It doesn't look much like a dog, but it's actually a dog. And we want to, this classifier to take as input images, but with this, this type of images, which are basically just arrays of uh, points, 2D arrays of points. And so what a classifier does in deep learning is that it's going to take this image and gradually transform it by applying some linear transformation, some non-linearity, some various things. It's going to gradually transform it up to the point where we end up with, here it's going to say dog, but what we really end up with are probabilities. You know, you have, here it's going to be like, for example, 99% sure that it's a dog and 1% sure that it's a cat, okay? So you have this transformation from images to, uh, to probabilities. Uh, and in this case here, we have three hidden layers and one output. We have the input layer, three hidden layers, and one output. So the symmetries we are going to consider for this case are rotations by multiple of 90 degrees. If you rotate this image, you should still say that this is a dog. The symmetries are things that transform your input, okay? So when you apply the symmetry, the image is transformed. But when you apply the symmetry, the thing at the end is not transformed. So the input is transformed, but the output is left invariant. And now the question is, well, what do, should we do with the thing in the middle? The input is transformed, the output is invariant. What should happen to the thing in the middle? You know, should they be, should we care? Should we, uh, should they be invariant? Should they transform as well with the, with, with the symmetries? What should be the relationship between the hidden layers and the symmetries? So one suggestion is that the symmetries should also transform the middle layers up to a point where things become invariant. Okay, so here's an example where at the top, we have our image of a dog, and then we have a first layer, which gives you some activation. So the idea here is that black is close to zero and white is close to one or something like that. And you see that when we rotated the picture at the bottom by 90 degrees, all of the activations have also been retained by the same 90 degree uh, transformation. And then at the end, something happens where suddenly we do something so that the output becomes independent of the symmetry. Okay, so in that case, we say that the beginning, uh, the mathematical language here is that the first layers are, we say they are equivalent, they change with the symmetries, and the last layer is invariant. These are words that you will see a lot in the, in, in, in the literature. No, oh, yeah, sorry. Do you assume that uh, transformations are, uh, are invertible or not? Yeah, uh, so. The symmetries are all invertible here. So the map, the rotations are invertible, but the map from the dog to the, to, the, uh, to the activation, this is not an invertible map. Yes, it's just the symmetries which are invertible. Yeah, so I can go from the top, all of the top things to the bottom things, and I have inf enough information to come back. So in that sense, it's invertible. But going from the dog to the activation, that's not invertible. Um, so you might ask why split things this way? Why not have equivalent only on the first two layers, for example, and invariant from the third layer? Well, partly it's a, it's a question of taste. 
But I think there are also some very good arguments why it's better to keep things equivalent for as long as possible. So keep things in this thing where we transform the input. And the point is that invariance tends to throw away information. Uh, and whereas equivariance can actually preserve a lot of information. Can delete, in this case, clearly, when we go from this email to this kind of activation, we clearly deleted some information that's related to your question. But there are still some things that can be preserved. And invariants tend to throw away even more information. And so it makes sense to try to preserve information for as long as possible and move to invariant only near the end. So the example here uh, had invariants with respect to rotation of the input picture, but once again, there are many more type of invariances which can be relevant. So, you know, when counting objects, we don't care about the order of the object, we don't care about the color of the object, we don't care about the color of the floor, we don't care uh, about many things like, like that. Yes? Do you think that So you're asking there could be more symmetries in the middle layers? Sorry, can you read? Do you think that the myth alone is Oh, I see. Okay. Let me try to paraphrase the question and you can tell me if, if I understood well. So you're asking if meta learning lets you discover new symmetries which you didn't know about? Uh, well, if that's the question, I, I, I would agree yes, but it's super hard. <laughs> a lot of, I mean, learning what are the symmetries of your uh, problem is like still very much an open problem. There's still a lot of papers that, 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 that try to do that. And you can do it in some certain cases, but it's really, really, really hard. Um, I think that be because of the kind of problem we've been interested in, which are physics problems, where we know what the symmetries are, I, I haven't been that much involved with the discovery of the, the symmetries. In that case, it's more like we know what are the symmetries, we just put them in. And, but, you know, it's, life is complicated enough. Okay. Yeah. So I introduced these terms of equivariance and invariance, and let's see some more formal uh, definition. So assume that we have two spaces, X and Y. So here, for example, X could be the spaces of images, like dogs and cats and trees and whatnot. And Y could be a, a, a space of probabilities, logits. For example, you know, you have a, a two-dimensional space which gives you the probability of it being uh, a cat or, or, or something else. So typically in machine learning, this X and Y will be vector spaces, spaces of uh, features. Okay. Assume that the group G acts on both X and Y. So G could be again, in our previous example, it was a set of rotation by 90 uh, degrees. So we say that a function F, so a function here, think of it as a neural network. A neural network is nothing else than just a, a learned function. So we say that a function f from x to y is invariant if we have this property here that f of a transform x is the same as f of x. Doesn't matter. For all of our transformation, we still get the same uh, value. And we say that another function f is equivariant at the bottom. So instead, of the first one was about invariant, the second one is equivariant if transforming the input and then applying f gives us the same thing as first applying f and then uh, transforming the output. And this is also represented by this commutative diagram. So at the top here, we have invariance, and at the bottom, we have uh, equivalence. Um, <coughs> by the way, I have no idea how much, how well I'm doing on time. Yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. Oh, yes. So equivalence in the case, in that case, we wouldn't have equivalence from the map going from the dog to uh, this, but we might have looked at what happens to the activation map at the top. Well, it, it, it does have this, this activation. They, they, they are a space of images, they are three by three images. Rotations do act on these images as well by 
rotating. Look at how, if you take this picture, the first one at the top left. Hmm? Oh, for the output. For so the output, it would be invariant. There wouldn't be any equivalent in that case. So some maps will be equivalent, some maps will be invariant. The full map that goes from images to this one is invariant, not equivalent. It's only some of the intermediary map. This whole map is made by composing other maps together. And some of these maps are equivalent, some of these maps are invariant. Yes? So I understand the F applies to GFX, so the F is the network. Um, yes. So if you were to take the image, transform the image, then the label DOM. But then uh, you have also G of F of X, right? That's the F variance. So which means like when you uh, uh, you transform actually the label because F of X is the label, yeah. right? So, so you transform the label with the, in the next slide. Yes, in the next slide. Yeah, G of F of X. Right? So. so in the case of equivalent, that does not apply to the entire neural network that I gave in the previous example. That only applies to a sub part of the network. Okay. No, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So think of it like just the first two or three layers, they are going to be equivalent, and that should be your F. But the entire thing is not going to be equivalent. You can also, for invariance, you can also view it as equivalence and just associate. Every element G associated with the identity transformation, then you are acting from the output wise by keeping it constant. So G F X is equal to F of X yeah. for every G. Okay. Yeah. You just predicted one of my future slides. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's look at uh, example of invariant and equivariant transformations. So the first example on the top right here shows a very simple update rule for a feature. Uh, at a node of a GNN. Okay. So since the incoming value, x1 and uh, x2, are multiplied by the same value, uh, a, before we add them, this update, this particular update, is invariant to the permutation of x1 and x2. If you permit, you put x2 on the left and x1 on the, on, on the right, you still end up with the same activation uh, value coming out. So this is invariant. So for equivariance, assume that both x and y, for example, are 3D spaces in R3. And let's say that your function is uh, just a map from R3 to itself, and it's multiplication by 2. So it's a, not a very exciting neural network, but it's, you know, it's, some, it's, it's a transformation. So this transformation is equivalent to rotation, because if you have a vector and you make it twice as big and then you rotate, the same as if you had started with your vector, rotated, and then made it twice as big. So that's an equivalent. An example of equivalent transformation. So I introduced these two, and that's going to come into your point. I introduced these two important notions of invariance and equivalence. And I will next try, I will next describe how to build invariant and equivalent map. But before that, I wanted to demonstrate a deep connection be between these two things. And exactly the point that was made earlier, which is that on any space, for any space and any group, you can always define an action called a trivial action, which basically moves nothing. Okay? And if you do that, then you see that invariance is a kind of equivalence. It's maybe you're cheating a little bit, but it's a way of like unifying these two different notions into, uh, in, into one and realizing that they are, they are related to, to, to each other. <laughs> okay, so let's see the, the first method, because I've talked a lot about invariant equivalent. I haven't given any method on how to build invariant or equivalent neural network. So let's look at a, a first uh, approach to build uh, invariant uh, maps. So assume that X and Y are just vector spaces, which is the most common uh, case in machine learning. You have uh, images are embedded into vector spaces. And assume that F is any map from X to Y. So I'm not going to assume that this particular F at the top is invariant. It's just really just like a neural network. You randomly initialize a weight and you just transform your thing. So there's no invariance or equivalence at this point. Well, it turns out that you, go, you can always build an invariant map from this by using something called group averaging. And I've written the formula on the slide. For that formula, we will assume that our group G is finite. So the, the sum is, uh, is finite and well-defined. Although the, this formula can be extended in some other cases to, uh, take, uh, to a continuous group. But I think it's much simpler to, to look at this finite case. So what you do is that you first consider all possible transformations. So you have your input x, 
And you're going to consider all possible transformation of your input X under your group uh, G. Then you're going to apply your function F, so your neural network, to all of these transformations. Then you sum, and then you divide that. That's to, to, to look nice. You divide by the size of the group. So you're basically taking the average. Well, this technique is called uh, group averaging. And it turns out that this lets you transform any map F, which is not necessarily invariant, into a map which is uh, invariant. So this H underscore F is invariant. It's also a projection, and that's also why the division by the size of G is there, is that if you happen to start with the F which is invariant, then H of F is equal to F. You haven't changed anything. Okay. So let's see this uh, group averaging in practice. We start from an arbitrary map from images to vectors. So again, we started from our images of cats and dogs, and then we have this map that maps to something to three by three uh, set of activations. Our feature, our first feature in your layer. So we first consider all possible transformation of our input. So all rotation by 90 degrees. This is a group we're interested in here. Then we apply our neural network independently to all of these images. And we take the average of all of these uh, inputs, of all of these outputs, sorry. So if instead we had started with a rotated picture, so if instead of starting from this one of the dog looking up, we, had, we started with a rotated picture and followed exactly the same procedure, the final output would be exactly the same, which is to say that we have defined an invariant map. Yes? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear the beginning. But it, is it true that it's not important that it's an active variable? Oh, the, this one is just like a map. I, I'm not assuming that this case is okay. necessarily, yeah, it doesn't matter at all if it's equivalent or not. That could be like any neural network that goes from this dot to this thing. Yes, thanks for clarifying that. So now let's look at equivalence. So we've looked at how to build invariant map. Let's look at how to build equivalent uh, map. So I told you that invariance is a form of uh, equivalence. Well, it turns out that the opposite is also uh, true. Um, so these two notions are really very uh, related. So indeed, let's look again at our set. Uh, let's look at uh, the set of all maps from X to Y. So we're not just looking at a single map. Now we're looking at the set of all possible, you know, you, you have a certain architecture, for example, and you look at the set of all possible maps that can be represented by this architecture when you vary the weight of your neural network. So that's going to be this Z. And we can define uh, an action of, uh, so this is a vector space, if you're not just restricted to, uh, to, to neural network, but as a set of all maps from X to Y, this is a vector space, you can add such function, you can multiply by a constant, you can do all of these sort of things. And we can define an action on Z by this particular formula here. And it turns out that this slightly odd looking formula means that the invariant map under these actions are actually the set of equivalent map. Um, and this is interesting because it lets us understand why group averaging can also be used to define equivalent maps. So before we use equivalent map, group averaging to define invariant maps. But you can also use that the same, a very similar technique to define equivalent map using very similar looking formula. So I've written here a formula which given any function f to, from x to y, again, some neural network doesn't have to be invariant or equivalent. And then we, by doing this group averaging, we are transforming it into k underscore f, which is an equivalent map. And the only difference with before, if you look uh, if you remember what we had before, is that we had this extra G inside the, uh, the, the, the sum. This, sorry, the, yeah, the extra gene inside the, the sum. So here again, this method has been used in machine learning. Uh, the, the, the two papers at the, the, the top right, the first one I was involved uh, in that paper, and the second one is by somebody else. So these two papers use these kind of uh, ideas in, in real uh, cases. The top one is uh, applying some problem in, in, in physics. 
Yes. Does that mean that you can reconstruct the repeated images if you have the learned filter somehow? No, no, because the symmetries are the, the symmetries are the thing which are invertible, but the maps themselves, so the scale of f is not an invertible one. So if you just have the feature, you cannot go back to the, if you look at f of x, you cannot go back to x. Why is it not invertible? I'm just asking. Oh, in this case, it's I mean or can you impose that? You you can and some no, no, uh, well, in fact, it turns out that actually it does make sense in some cases. It can be used for in some uh, generative models to have invariant, this kind of invertible map. But one simple way to see that this is not invertible is that I'm going from the space of images, which is a very high dimension space, to the space of activation, which is a nine dimension space. So that can be invertible, for example. But you can still have a covariant and invariant map between these things. Would it make sense to try to generate these uh, samples from the uh, average map? Like, think about this entanglement here, but in, in a different sense. Like, you're so you have different modes, four modes here, then you have like an average distribution, and you're trying to reconstruct the four modes from the average template, and this can be used to do generation. So, I'm using this in GMS. I just connected the ideas, but I have no idea. Uh, um, I mean, about how it links properly to symmetries and what you, this illustration. I'm not sure. But I think some of these ideas that have indeed you been in disentanglement. That's definitely uh, the, the, the case. Uh, but maybe if we discuss later, yes. then we can, uh, yeah. Not sure I can think on the spot for <laughs> that one. We have five more minutes. Five more minutes? Yes. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> We have lunch then. Yeah, very important. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you say in the beginning, but uh, how, historically speaking, how does subject appear? Like, how did you realize that the symmetry aspect that is really classical in the mathematics area? But how did you realize that symmetries are going to be really, uh, a big deal for uh, machine learning topics, or how did it appear? Well, that, that's a very good question. I don't actually have the full answer to that because it's often that, you know, we tend to represent, when we present things, we tend to present things in the way that makes sense to us now, not in the way, as I said, in which they appear. And for me, it makes sense to talk about this now. I have no idea if Jan Lecan talked about uh, translation symmetry when he invented uh, CNN. I don't know if anybody knows. Uh, I don't know. And so, but do you know, like, if, like, the how this topic is gonna impact the area? Because I already an idea of how it's gonna impact it, or how it can potentially impact it. So you probably you you already said that you eventually um, quicken the training or fasten the training yeah. of the algorithms. Or is it the main uh, area of uh, application, or maybe of kind of? Okay, so I'm going to take some wild guess here. I think that when it comes to applying. Uh, these kind of things to physical sciences, okay. the more fundamental physical sciences are going to have huge impacts. So okay. the kind of work I've been involved in where we look at things like quantum field theory, it's very fundamental, but very mathematical in nature. Taking symmetries into account makes a massive difference. It goes from learning absolutely nothing to learning something very unique. When it comes to something like language, well, you, you do have some symmetries, things like that. We have so much data, honestly. Right now, you like, who cares? It's, uh, I don't think it, it matters so much. I also think that as you move towards, uh, you know, when you move away from fundamental physics to what I would describe as more like real world, like fundamental physics is real world, but it's just that it's, it's really being abstracted away. As you move away from that, I would guess that the world gets so messy that this language of symmetry gets less and less. It's, it's useful to think about it, but you shouldn't take it like, you, know, you should take it with a grain of salt, I think. Um, Okay, so let's see. We have. Maybe we get ten minutes. Is it okay for you? I I can try ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm always worried about not having enough material. So. Um. So here's. Uh, let, let's see some examples of um more. And uh, invariants. Um, so let's go further and see other methods. So this relationship between variance and equivariance goes actually very deep. 
And yes, sorry. No, don't worry. Uh, we know that there is an invariance in the system, then to take us to more data and to apply like uh, uh, like um, learning uh, algorithms like that and take into account the invariance, or to stick with the set of data that we have, but average the. Okay, so, so in many ways that question is related to 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 to, to your question. Is that it depends how much you know? It depends a lot on how much data you have and how much compute. Uh, you have. So the take building the equivalent and the invariance inside the, the neural network helps you learn faster initially. But I don't know what happens. If you, if you can really train like a, a big network for a month, maybe it really doesn't matter if you build any invariance or equivalence because it will learn it by itself. And it might actually learn better because you have to be less constraint on the space of function that can be explored for uh, learning. So I would say that if you have a, a very small data set and you don't have much compute, that's definitely the regime where it makes a lot more sense to take invariance and equivalence in place. <coughs> because if you train on a very small data set, you're very likely to start overfitting very quickly. So taking invariance and equivalence into account might gain you something uh, here. Yeah. <coughs> So let's continue exploring this relationship between variance and equivalence. Um, and here's an example of how to build an equivalent map from an invariant map. So let's say you have your features are in Rn again. And let's say that you have managed to build a function from Rn to R, just R, which is invariant. Well, it turns out that then the gradient of these functions are going to be a map from Rn to Rn, and it's going to be an equivalent map. So here is an example where uh, it's a bit hard to see here, but you have a kind of a gradient, and you see that you have this rotation in values. So in this picture, what we have is a map from R2 to R, and the colors, the intensity of the color gives you the actual value. So dark is for small values and bright is for large values. So this is a way of representing the map from R to R. If you take the gradient of that, you end up with something that looks like that. And you see that now you have a map from R2 to R2. At every single point in space, you get a vector, which is also a point in R2. It's a vector. And we have this rotation invariant, as in, if, as you move, if you move your point by rotating, then the, the vectors are also being rotated. And this kind of technique also has been used in machine learning. So if you start with an invariant map, you can build an equivariant map by using this technique. It's also been uh, used if you restrict the kind of function you're looking at. For example, if you look at something called strictly convex function, it turns out that the function from Rn to Rn that you build are equivalent diffeomorphisms. And that's also used in some uh, generative model settings. Okay, and uh, the last thing I wanted, the, the last tool I wanted to mention for building invariance and equivariance is called, uh, this, this one is to build invariance especially, is called gauge fixing. So gauge fixing is this idea that maybe you have a large group of symmetries, but maybe, you know, you're looking at object and there's always a way of choosing a preferred position of your object. So example would be like this kind of, you know, you have object in 3D and here's a long elongated uh, box. And where well, you might say that there are some principal direction in these boxes, the length, the height, and the width. And if you align this direction with your space, then you have put your box into a preferred position. And these only things in this preferred position that you're going to fit to your neural network. That's one way of dealing with symmetries. So in this case, this particular example, there are still some uh, things which are not well defined. But if you take your box and you rotate it by 190 degrees like that, then you end up with a new box with, where all of the axes are still aligned. But now you just have a finite number of symmetries which are left. You know, initially we had all, maybe all symmetries of the space, which is a, a continuous group. Now we have a small discrete group, which is all of this, you know, rotation by 190 uh, degrees. And you can maybe deal with that with group averaging or data augmentation, 
or maybe you just don't care and you just let the network do its thing and then it's going to be fine. Okay, so we can summarize uh, some uh, what we've seen up to now. So we've seen that symmetries are this invertible transformation that change something but preserve uh, other things. So we look at this example where the overall uh, pattern was being transported and uh, preserved. We saw that symmetries are a powerful tool for data efficiency. You can learn faster because if you learn at one point, you can learn something about all of the other transform uh, points. It can generalize better because maybe you haven't seen many points during your training, but now suddenly uh, you, you, you know something about much more data. And it can be used for disentanglement. So it's learning about what are the factors of variations uh, that matter. And finally, we saw that invariance and equivariance, uh, these are like the most common concepts used to build symmetries into uh, models. They are deeply related. You can bin one from uh, the other. And many techniques are available to add invariance and equivalence to your uh, model. And um, since I already took too much time, maybe we can skip the last section. Five minutes. OK, so five minutes, I can just skip to this slide and just say that there was uh, one of the two projects I've been involved with in physics was about modeling uh, atoms and how they relate, you know, how they, what are the different phase transitions that can happen if you put atoms in a, in a box at a certain temperature and you have this atom may have a certain property. Are you going to end up with a gas? Are you going to end up with a liquid or a solid? What happens when you vary the pressure and, uh, and the temperature? And in this particular case, we had so this atom put inside a box. For various reasons, we use a box with periodic boundary condition. That means that if you end up in a bit like Pac-Man, if you end up, if you exit the box from one side, you, end, you appear from the other. That's just like a, a very cheap computational way of saying that we deal with infinite space but on a, on a fi finite uh, volume. And the kind of symmetries that were involved in these problems where we had translations, you could translate, uh, if you translated all of the particles together, then that shouldn't change any of the properties. This was a group of uh, the, uh, continuous group of dimension three. We could reorder any of the three spatial directions. There was no gravity, so it didn't matter, you know, what X, Y, Z, Z, Y, X, or any order. So that's a group of size six. And reordering of the atom was a group of size uh, factorial N. And then well, you can guess that the most important symmetry to take into account here was definitely this last one. The first two one, so we, we still took the first one into account because it was cheap to do but we really didn't care about the second one and that lets us uh, design the neural, uh, be a bit more free to design the, the neural network. Uh, and the, the last one was the one which, which didn't take that into account and nothing worked at all because it's a huge uh, group of uh, symmetry. And I think the last one, I think you're probably tired, so I'm not going to talk about quantum field theory straight away. I'm just going to say that in this particular uh, case, again, we were working on a grid. Uh, the, the grid had a bunch of translations. This time, because it was a grid, we had only uh, discrete translations, and we had L to the 4. This was in space-time, so we had four dimensions for, for, for space-time. Uh, we had we could also reorder some of the spatial axes, and we had some large group of continuous transformation, which was a very high dimensional. And again, taking the first one and the last one into account is crucial to making any progress into uh, the field. The one in the middle, we don't care at all, and we can just let the uh, network learn about that by itself. So we can do data augmentation or just not care at all, and it, it, it works fine. That's it. Thank you.